You know, there's an old saying that uh, you look at a Bentley, but you look inside a Rolls, you know? And that's what happens when you have one of these. People don't look at the car. They see the car. Ooh, and then they want to see who's, who's driving a car like that, you know? There is the tendency to sneer at lesser cars. For example, I'll have the camera car pull up, and I'll show you what a typical Rolls-Royce driver would do. of Jay Leno's Garage, the vehicle we're featuring today, 1965 Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud III with an impeccable providence. It is a one-owner car. It was donated to the Peterson Museum upon the death of the owner, who was John Frankenheimer, the great director. He did Manchurian Candidate, did my favorite film, Grand Prix, and of course, if you love the car scenes in Ronan, he was the ultimate car guy. I remember I was sitting at uh, Cantor's Deli on Fairfax Avenue once, and I said, oh, that's Frank Heimer. He goes, Jay, Jay. And he runs over to my table. I got a 6.9. I got to tell me all about it. And it was great. We had a great discussion. He was a, just a lovely guy. And this car is interesting. He was in France directing a movie called The Train. And he was a guy, he was a, a huge guy. He had long arms. So he had to have all his shirts custom made. So he and his wife were uh, on the way, from, took the train, I guess, from France to London to go to a shirt maker. And they're walking down the street and they passed the Rolls Royce dealership. And they had a Bentley and a Rolls. And he got in the Bentley and the guy said, uh, he was a little tight in that. He goes, a bit more room in the Rolls. He sat in the Rolls Royce. Uh, and he bought it on the spot for cash. And he gave it to his wife. I think it was then wife. He said it was a wedding present. Uh, sadly, he died in 2002, but kept this car his whole time. And his wife continued to keep the car. She donated it to the Peterson Museum. And, you know, he was an interesting guy. Uh, he was one of those great directors. And whenever he had a film shoot in another country or someplace not his home base, he would have the car shipped there. And almost every famous movie star in the world, certainly everyone who appeared in his films, rode in this car because he brought it with him to uh, all, all the film sites. And then on June 6th, 1968, this car was parked at the Ambassador Hotel waiting for a young presidential candidate named Robert F. Kennedy to get in the back seat and be whisked away. And obviously, we all know that never happened because he was assassinated on that day. But this car was a piece of that history as well. And his lovely wife, who is still with us, is, goes down to the Peterson and occasionally sits in the car. And her initials are on here. I'm not going to say her name or anything. I don't want anybody to bother her, but just a lovely person. And it's just a great romantic story. He bought this for her and kept it through their whole marriage. And I don't know if this is original paint or not. It's almost hard to believe it's so good. It might be resprayed in certain areas. I know the interior is 100% original. It's only got 27,000 miles, because as a film director, you don't get a lot of free time to go out and drive. But what free time he had, he would use this to uh, take friends and actors and other people in his movies to dinner. And it's just a romantic vehicle. And you know, it drives wonderfully. This is what people think of when they think of a Rolls Royce. I mean, I've told this story a bunch of times in relation to other things, but I'll tell it in relation to for Rolls. These are not expensive cars now. They built probably, I think, about 2,700 of them the whole run from, let me see this. The, v, the V8s ran from 59 to 65, the Cloud Series. They're under $100,000. The convertibles, of course, in multiples of $100,000, two, three, four hundred thousand, depending on condition. And you see a lot of these in rather ragged shape, and you can get them fairly cheaply. Our friends over at uh, Icon uh, took one and put a big American V8 in it, and you know, it just made it an incredibly fast car. We did a road test on it once. It was a lot of fun. But <clears throat> this is a car you drive swiftly. You don't drive it fast. You drive it swiftly. The V8 puts out about 200 horsepower. I think by 65, it was probably up to 240 or 250, which was adequate. It was an old-fashioned car, even when new. But even back in the day, it was always impeccably put together, impeccably engineered. Four-speed General Motors hydromatic transmission, 6.2 liter V8. Uh, originally, these came with a straight six, which a lot of people like better because they were incredibly smooth, incredibly quiet, and very easy to work on. This V8 is kind of crammed in there, even though it looks like a big wide car. There's not a lot of room. You actually have to jack it up, remove the wheel to get to the spark plugs. So it's, it's a little bit more maintenance intensive. But 
the extra horsepower, 25 or 30 percent more than the six, really makes a difference uh, when you're driving it. Um, anyway, the story I was going to tell you was a buddy of mine bought one of these in very rough shape for about $15,000. The mechanics are not complicated. V8, General Motors automatic transmission, bulletproof rear end. The real money in these is the interior, getting the wood, doing the paint, the leather. I mean, you can spend $25,000 doing this interior easy, just doing the leather and the seats and everything to that Rolls-Royce standard. I believe Rolls-Royce has a book with exactly what type of wood and replacement wood available for every car, so, so I was led to believe. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, everything's available for these. And as I said, <clears throat> it looks like the classic roll. So anyway, the story is, a buddy of mine comes over here with this $15,000 rolls he bought and hubcaps are missing and, it, and we tuned it up and we got it running pretty smooth. Changed the plugs, did all the other things. I go, all right, let's take it around. So I'm driving it and I got up here to the corner. Now, I'm on that corner with everything from uh, Maybach, Mercedes, Bugattis, Lamborghinis, the F1 McLaren, everybody waves. I pull up in this Rolls Royce and <laughs> guy gives me the finger because I look like, oh, I just look like a rich guy in a Rolls Royce. It just made me laugh. I mean, I guess I am a rich guy, but I was in a, and some of this made the guy angry because this looks like the landlord coming to collect the rent. Any movie where there's a bad guy, whether it's Goldfinger or whoever it might be, they all seem to be driving this style of Rolls. Although the Goldfinger one was from the 30s. That was a Wraith, I believe. Because it looks like Oh, a rich guy's car. You know, modern Rolls is sort of blend in a, little, a bit more. They don't have this, as I call it, the Grey Poupon look to it, you know. So it has a stance. It's quite comfortable. Yeah, let's open the hood and show you what that V8 looks like. The fun thing is there's no plastic on this. Everything is metal. OK, here we go. As you can see, that's, that's crammed in there. Now, this does not look original, this uh, radiator. Certainly, that cap is not. Uh, this is aluminum. That, that, that might be a replacement radiator. So, uh, But there's no plastic in this thing. Everything is metal. I love the oil filler cap down here. Look at this. It looks like something from a, a steamship. You know, you when crossing the Atlantic, be sure to change the oil. There you are. Just a big, everything kind of clicks in and snaps in. Everything, just everything is metal on this. It, it, hilarious, is this, yeah, that's metal as well. Yeah, not a lot of room, as you can see. And then you have to, when I was a kid, there was a famous ad of a diamond cutter in the back seat of a Rolls Royce and, and one in the back seat of a Ford LTD, and you know, which one is smoother riding, and the guy cuts the diamond perfectly, you know, $25,000 something diamond, you know. And of course, a classic hood, hood ornament, the flying lady. Uh, a lot of people think these are silver, they're not silver, and you don't want to polish these too much because eventually all the sort of features wear off of them, that's what they warn you about. I believe this is German nickel, I'm not, I, don't hold me to that. When I was a kid, I worked at a place called Foreign Motors on in, uh, Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. And we used to service these, and they would come in regularly. And in Boston, they were all what they call sand over sable, two shades of brown. This combination, a lot of black, no reds, no greens. They were always sort of very conservative colors. In fact, we got a convertible in once that was red, and it sat on the showroom floor for a year and a half. And my boss said, send it to California, and it sold in two weeks. So that shows you the difference. I like it with black wall tires. I think it looks a bit more proper. And you know, there's a whole generation of guys, meeting my generation, that obviously couldn't have afforded one of these. This car was $19,900 something dollars when it was new, which was unbelievable. My parents paid $19,000 for their house in the 60s. So, well, 1959. So that showed you how expensive this was. Uh, but now the Rolls-Royce Club is really terrific because everything's available for these. And like, you can buy them fairly reasonable. I know under $100,000 doesn't seem reasonable, but you certainly get $100,000 worth of workmanship in these things. Uh, the back seat is 
it's not overly roomy. This is the normal short wheelbase, but actually quite a comfortable place to be once you're inside. You know, when Mercedes built their, their 600 back in the early 60s, they didn't like this. Listen. Just those heavy electric motors. And they made the doors somewhat thick, and the window couldn't go all the way down, so they went with hydraulics, which is, as in typical German fashion, incredibly expensive to do, but uh, so much more efficient, quiet. And But listen as it goes up. And of course, your tray tables. You gotta have these and close that. This way you can do a bit of writing or write angry letters to the tenants. I expect the rent on the first of the month. If not, you'll be evicted immediately. Thank you. Hmm. There you are. Onward. Johnson. You know, so. Uh, but it's, it's very nice back here. And this is just the old school Rolls Royce. Don't forget, Rolls Royce was only yeah, about 50 years old. This is halfway through their legacy, so to speak. Uh, the headliner, all this, I believe, is original to the car. And it's just, just a wonderful, wonderful old girl. Got speakers in the back for the radio. You know, things we take for granted now, rear speakers and electric window, these, those were a huge deal back in the day. Let me put that window on and see. There you are, look at that. Yeah. I get, get the full effect here. Yeah, hmm. You know, I don't even like Grey Poupon, but you just feel like you want to eat it by the jar full when you're sitting back here. And I'll show you the trunk. See, you can actually turn sideways and get out very gracefully, you see. Fuel filler right here. Releases from inside. That was another rich guy thing. Uh, I just love... No plastic, everything is chrome. I mean, full-size trunk, as you can see, it goes quite far back. And you've got spare tire and everything underneath there, but nice size trunk. Let's get behind the wheel. The nice thing about this car is this was a driver's car. This wasn't a chauffeur driven. I mean, you could be chauffeur driven if you wanted, but this is for the owner driver, uh, which is what most of the customers were, you know? When you could afford something like this, you wanted the pleasure of driving it. And when I worked at the dealership, I loved to move these around the shop. I love the thin steering wheel, very simple. This one has a modern radio in it. I used to like the old radio phone or whatever the British version was. It's got air conditioning. These were old fashioned cars by 65. Cadillac was gaining ground, and in some ways, I always said the greatest car in the world was the 1949 Cadillac, because when Rolls-Royce was a six-cylinder with a manual shift, rolled-up windows, and no power steering, Cadillac in 49 had overhead valves, hydraulic lifters, power windows, air conditioning, power steering, power brake, even a power top if it was electric. And that was just an amazing automobile. But these were all about build quality. There's nothing built quite like a Rolls. And they, they run quiet and they run smooth. And the leather and all that, just, just immaculate. I went to the factory in England <laughs> years ago. And it's one of those things where, uh, actually it was, it, was in, uh, it was the Bentley factory, basically the same thing. We go in, they got, that's where the bomb came through the roof in 41. Uh, they show you the bomb. They, still not quite fixed, you know, this is like uh, early 70s. And I see a woman with an iPad, hello dearie, and she's got a big needle and thread, and she's so, we might have seats right here, we do. I don't know, a cup of tea, and <laughs> tea kettle's whistling, and she's got a coat on, because there's no heat in the place. I mean, it was hilarious, <laughs> it was hilarious. It's not that way anymore, so luckily they've improved. Okay, you've got all these little bitty doors in here, but everything just fits nicely. And of course, your four-speed hydromatic transmission. I think what they did was, I, th I think they took the General Motors transmissions, sort of rebuilt them their way, just to make sure there was no leaks or gaps or anything like that. There's a lot of rumors about this V8. A lot of people thought this V8 was a copy of an American V8. It was not. They developed their own. Uh, in fact, they started working on it back in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, and it was finally introduced in, uh, 
in 59. Now this is their own V8, 6.2 liter, two valve. Uh, they would never tell you the horsepower, they always said adequate, but I think it was 200 or two and a quarter, something like that, but more than enough to move it swiftly. Top speed on this car is probably 116 to 120. Uh, you, you don't wanna go 120 in this. No, it gets a little dicey out there. Uh, of course, just a handbrake by hand. Uh, just a lot of things that had sort of bypassed them. Uh, the new sh Shadow was coming out in 66, and it was a very nice car, but it didn't have the prestige, you know. Whenever you see like West Palm Beach, Florida, or, or uh, Beverly Hills, or you know, especially like the Beverly Hillbillies or something, rich people always drove these because it just, it just looked like a Rolls Royce. It looked like, you know, the banker coming around. Uh, I see the air conditioning vents were integrated into the car, which was uh, something still fairly new in, in, in the mid 60s. You know, a lot of times you bought a, a Ford or a Mustang uh, in, in the 60s. You got a big box air conditioner that fit on the transmission tunnel here, and it was sort of an aftermarket affair. It wasn't built in, that all came much later. Very comprehensive gauges. You've got just miles per hour here. There's no tachometer because it's a Rolls Royce. And, and as I said, this car is one owner with 27,000 miles. I mean, if you're looking to buy a Rolls Royce, you'd want one like this because most of these tended to be well taken care of. You know, this wasn't a car that people abused. It was taken out for special occasions. Of course, so many got hired at wedding cars and stuff over the years and a bit worn out. But uh, and you've got locking compartments here. That's very Rolls Royce. Okay. And these are adjustable. You can move the uh, that rests up and down. Normally I would take this over next door and put it up in the lift, but Bernard's got his race bus up there. He's uh, doing something with the uh, transmission. So we'll take it for a ride. Let's see how she goes. Let's start it up. driving one of these things it's just all about being comfortable and cruising along I, I, you know I just love uh, gripping this thin steering wheel wheels now are so these big thick things you know it's just so nice it's so driving you sit up high I mean this is about as aerodynamic as a brick but it does it, it wafts and if you look at that you're just wafting through the air you, you know you come to a corner if it says 35 miles an hour exit, you're going 36. Those tires are going to be screeching. That's okay. If it says 35, you're probably going 28. You know, it really is like being in your library at home. You know, you've got this. Assuming, if you have a car like this, you have a library in your house. I mean, I love the wood. Even what 60 years later, the smell of the leather is still still gets to you. It is a bit like driving an SUV, you sit up so high. For example, when you adjust the seat, it's all, you've got to pull a lever and move it. There's no electric adjustment. By 65, 66, Cadillac, Imperial, Lincoln, they all had the power seat that went every which way. You know, back in the day, the Europeans might have had the edge and handling and braking and things like that, but we had the edge and comfort in terms of well, like I said, this is, I'm sure this is probably a General Motors air conditioning unit and the hydromatic transmission. But you can't fault how well it's made. All the wood from the same matching tree, all that kind of deal, you know. I love the fact that John went in and just bought it off the floor and has kept it all these years. Or his wife has kept it after he passed away. <coughs> When people see these, they recognize it as something different, something special. In a lot of ways, it looks like uh, almost like a car from the late 40s in America, you know, one of the big Packards or any of those. You know, there's an old saying that uh, you look at a Bentley, but you look inside a Rolls, you know? And that's what happens when you have one of these. People don't look at the car, they see the car, ooh, and then they want to see who's, who's driving a car like that, you know? You know, Rolls Royce used to have an ad at 60 miles an hour, the only noise you hear is the ticking of the clock in the dashboard. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but 
I guess there might be some truth to it. But there's just something about this car that makes you drive it sedately. You know, I, I'm enjoying this driving this car. I feel like Mr. Drysdale in the Beverly Hillbillies. I know he drove an Imperial. He drove a 67 Imperial. But this is what Mr. Drysdale should have. I mean, she hustles along rather nicely. Uh, it's a 65 miles an hour. And it's quiet in here. Not a lot of wind noise. You have to allow for being, you know, 60 years old, you're going to get some... Uh, almost 60 years old. Some wind noise around the seals, but I, I don't hear it. It's, it's pretty quiet. And the Rolls-Royce owner's manual is not in this car, but you know, that's, uh, you know, looks like something written by Charles Dickens, you know, beautiful leather-bound book. And I don't know, just flip through the pages and, you know, it's fantastic. Charles Rolls and the Henry Royce, interesting characters. Uh, something a lot of people don't know, Charles Rolls is an aviator. He was the first man in Britain killed in an airplane. Uh, first one to die in a plane, so, uh, especially a plane under its own power. I think he died in 1910. And uh, Henry Royce was, I think he was an electrician. I hope I have my facts right here. But one of those meticulous guys where everything had to be exactly perfect. And when that Silver Ghost came out in, what was it, around uh, six, seven, eight, that whole thing, it truly was the best car in the world. There was nothing better built, nothing better manufactured. It ran quiet, started, did that London to Edinburgh run a thousand miles with the hood closed. And there's so many sort of uh, rumors about Rolls-Royce. Uh, I addressed the one about it being a copy of the Chevy engine. That's a phony one. Then there, they would say, oh, the hoods are sealed and can't be opened at the factory. No, that's not true. But that started from, I think, the London to Brighton, uh, London to uh, Edinburgh run, where they sealed the hoods for a thousand miles so you couldn't make any changes or modifications to show the car would be dependable. That's one. Uh, the Rolls Royce are guaranteed for life. That's a no, that's not true. Uh, and the same guarantee as anybody else, three years, whatever. Um, What's another Rolls-Royce rumor? Oh, the other one that uh, when the badge used to be, the RR used to be red, and then they changed it to black, and it was supposed to be the day that Henry uh, Royce died. Uh, he did die that year, but it was not to commemorate him. They just thought the red was a bit garish for Rolls's rather conservative customers, so they went with black numerals, uh, black uh, letters. And it just happened to coincide with his death, but no, it was not uh, not that at all. Every now and then, you might hear somebody say, uh, "Oh, my dad or somebody I know had a Rolls Royce with a straight eight engine." Now, they did make a straight eight engine, but it's for military use. I think the B80, B and B81. Uh, I think that straight eight was used in a couple of the really huge. Uh, Rolls Royces, you know, for royalty, the limousines. Uh, only for the royal family, the straight eight. They never made a straight eight for civilian use. Although people have tracked down the Rolls Royce straight eight military engine and used it in a number of specials, you know, for racing and things like that, multiple corporations and all that. It was supposed to be quite good. Compared to cars of the period, uh, this was extremely quiet. Uh, to modern cars, no, modern cars, you know, modern South Korea have gotten so good that it's, uh, it, this wouldn't hold a candle to, to a modern Rolls or Bentley or Mercedes or any of those. But back in the day, this, this was impressive. Actually still is. And the new Rolls-Royce company has come back quite strong. Because by the time the 80s and early 90s came around, Rolls-Royce was a bit hard-pressed to use that title, the best car in the world. Mercedes, uh, certainly, and plenty of other marks could have captured that title easily. So when uh, when BMW took over Rolls-Royce, they really did an excellent job of, uh, of making, it, uh, making it what it should be. There is the tendency to sneer at lesser cars. For example, I'll have the camera car pull up, and I'll show you what a typical Rolls-Royce driver would do. There aren't a lot 
lot of cars that are fun to drive at, you know, at, at the speed limit, you know, because you always want to go faster or they're boring. But this, it just sort of drifts along and it, you know, it kind of lulls you. There's no, there's no uh, cruise control. There's none of those silly American things that we seem to like so much. You know, it's so English. I remember when uh, I was working at the uh, dealership, the Rolls Royce dealership in 1969 as a kid, and the Corniche came out and it had a very controversial ad. It was a red Corniche, had a police car behind it with the lights on. There was an attractive woman sitting in the passenger seat, somewhat bemused by the fact that her rich boyfriend was being lectured by a policeman, and he gives him a ticket for speeding in the Corniche. And the Corniche was a two-door convertible. Uh, it was the most expensive Rolls Royce you could buy at the time, $29,900, which just seemed crazy, crazy. And I remember people complaining, no Rolls Royce driver should not be speeding, should not be given a ticket. But they just wanted to get the point across, this is kind of the Rolls Royce for the sporting guy willing to take a chance. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Very silly. But uh, I always remember that ad. Quite effective. But if you like old school Rolls Royces, this is one you want to look for. Mid 60s, Silver Cloud, two or three. Not hard to fix, you know. It's 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 points, it's carburetors, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're good at woodworking, uh, well, that, that comes in handy. You might want to refinish all this wood yourself. But all the money really in restoring these is mostly cosmetics because. The mechanicals are not crazy, it's just straight mechanical stuff. You know, you blow a head gasket, it's fine, it's not the end of the world. But, ugh, damage this wood, oh my god. I'm trying to match it, the grain, and stain it exactly, and uh, that could be a nightmare. But the air conditioner, very quiet, I've got it on now, it's about 85 degrees today here in LA, so. Just sort of waft along. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this bit of history on a great Rolls Royce, owned by a great guy, John Frankenheimer. I told you, once again, he and his wife, they bought it new. He gave it to his wedding gift. They stayed married the whole time until he died. And she still owns the car. Uh, it was donated to the Peterson Museum, and they maintained it very nicely for her and did a nice job. And they were kind enough to let me borrow it. So I was, I was glad I got to know John a little bit. He was a real car guy. And I, as I said, he loved this thing. He took it all over the world with him. Had his girl with him. What more can he ask for? Him, you know? You got the great car, you got the great wife. Life doesn't get any better than that. I know, because I got the same thing. See you guys, uh, see you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>